thinking about it, it's probably been, what, seven years since I've seen you, something like that. So it's been quite a while. Uh, I didn't realise it'd be quite that long. Um, but it's fantastic to have you join, joining us from Melbourne, where it is 9pm. So we're very grateful indeed. Um, and Hijun's going to be talking us, uh, to us today about a nano splicer, accurate identification of splice junctions from Oxford nanopore sequencing. And I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much again. Okay, uh, thanks for the introduction, Paul, and thanks for the invitation. It's my pleasure to present our latest work, Nano Splicer, to MRC Biostatistics Unit Seminar. Uh, this topic is very specific. So at the beginning, I will provide a brief introduction to splicing and Oxford nanopore sequencing data. Uh, my PhD students, uh, or oh, where is my cursor? Yeah, my PhD student, UPU, led this project, and he was co supervised with uh, Dr. Michael Clark on this project. Uh, uh, first, I will introduce mRNA alternative splicing. Uh, DNA is first transcribed into pre mRNA. Then uh, splicing retains some parts of the pre-mRNA and produces mRNA. And for example, in the left side, uh, splicing retains the blue and the yellow and the orange part and uh, produce uh, this particular mRNA. Uh, in the right side, splicing retains the blue and the green and orange and produce uh, this different mRNA. Uh, the parts of the pre-mRNA which are spliced into mRNA are called axons, and the remaining part are called introns. So as you can see, the same pre-mRNA can be spliced in different ways. Uh, the different mRNA produced from the same gene are called transcript isoforms, and you can see isoform A and isoform B, and these isoforms are translated into different proteins. So by using alternative splicing, a single gene can produce a diverse set of uh, transcript or protein isoforms and whose expression can control cell functions at a particular condition or developmental stage. Mm, for alternative splicing analysis, uh, scientists often aim to identify and quantify uh, expressed uh, transcript isoforms using RNA seq data. Uh, the short RNA seq read uh, has been successfully used to identify local splicing events such as uh, axon skipping. However, their read lengths are much shorter than typical transcript lengths. So it's challenging to identify the full length transcript isoforms using a short RNA seq read. So in this uh, simple example, I visualize the mapped junction read where uh, the two uh, black bars connected by the dotted line come from the same read and the split and map to the separated axons. Uh, so those mapped junction read can provide information on which two axons are connected in uh, expressed transcript isoforms, but uh, they cannot uh, identify, for example, which of these two possible isoform abundances is true. And for example, uh, if we connect uh, junction read uh, as shown here, then the, this junction read will support the uh, isoform abundance in the left panel. And you can see the three copies of a uh, isoform uh, with a B and C and E, and the two copies of isoform with a A and C and D. But if we connect junction read like this, then the, this read will support the uh, isoform abundance in the right panel. You can see the one copy of B and C and E, and two copies of B and C and D, and the two copies of A and C and E, okay? So you can see the, uh, this short junction read uh, to not have information to identify which of these two uh, isoform abundance is true. Uh, it's mostly due to the fact, first, uh, short read identify only a small fraction of transcript uh, from which uh, they are derived from. Uh, 
And the second, uh, the transcript isoforms uh, uh, from the same gene um, typically shared a big amount of the sequence, as you can see. But uh, long way they typically cover the entire full length transcript. So they have a natural advantage for identifying and quantifying the transcript isoforms. The Oxford nanofoil sequencing is one of long weed sequencing method. Uh, it works by recording changes in electrical current when uh, DNA or uh, RNA molecule moves through a nanopore. Uh, during the movement of the uh, molecule, uh, multiple nucleotides occupy the pore simultaneously. Uh, so the current level is influenced by uh, consecutive nucleotides occupying the pore at that time. So in this example, uh, this is the expected uh, current level when CCAAC uh, occupy the pole. Now, uh, CCCAA uh, fill the pole, so we expect a different current level corresponding to this particular camera. A uh, real signal from uh, nanopore sequencing is uh, a sequence of noisy current measurement, uh, which is visualized here and which is called a squigger, and the speed at which uh, each molecule passes through the pore is not constant. So we often observe a different dwell times for different k-mers. The typical splicing analysis of nanopore sequencing data is a first base polling squiggers using computational method, and then uh, mapping base code nanopore weed to a reference genome using uh, mappers such as Minimap2. But nanopore weed have a relatively high base coding error rate compared to a short weed. So unless there are very short uh, axons, they are still good at capturing which multiple axons are connected for transcript isoforms but this error rate makes weed mapping a near spike junction very difficult. Uh, this is an IGV plot uh, showing mapped nanopore weed uh, with an annotated transcript uh, at the bottom. And this, uh, this is the known spike junction. And due to the base cooling error in the nanopore weed, we often observe these inconsistent mapped spike junctions. So it's challenging to distinguish the real sprite junctions from mapping errors. So we can easily make a wrong sprite junction identification. The incorrect or the wrong identification of sprite junction can inhibit the study of um, encoded protein isoform functions. For example, uh, this paper identified uh, two isoforms with only uh, six nucleotide difference in their uh, sprite junction here. And but they showed uh, the two isoforms encoded proteins with different functions. So this example shows that uh, incorrect identification of sprite junction can inhibit detection of a novel protein isoform with a new function. So here, our goal is to develop a method to accurately identify a sprite junction using Oxford nanopore uh, sequencing. The previous work for uh, sprite junction identification in nanopore data either requires uh, additional information such as annotations and matched short read, uh, or uh, they use the information from other mapped read. The main limitation of using uh, information from other mapped read is they are more likely to fail to detect less abundant sprite junctions uh, because uh, those from the highly expressed uh, isoforms would replace rare sprite junctions. Uh, the poor performance of nanopore read mapping near a sprite junction is largely due to base coding errors which arise when base cooling method misinterpret the raw uh, signal squiggers. So motivated by this, 
we propose to use the information in the row signal squiggers uh, to improve the sprite junction identification. So by using the squigger corresponding to each read, uh, our method does not require annotations or match the short read, and also uh, its performance is, uh, is not affected by other mapped read, and the performance is independent of read depth, so uh, nanospricer has the potential to better identify where spy junctions. Okay, so nanospricer takes as input a reference genome and a mapped nanopore read and their squiggers. So in this slide, uh, I will introduce some terminology which I used uh, without proper introduction, and I will use during the seminar. Uh, the sprite junction uh, is a pair of five prime, three prime sprite sites, which are the boundaries between axons and introns. And in particular, uh, sprite junction uh, supported by a mapped weed are called mapped sprite junction, and their uh, sprite sites are called mapped five prime and three prime sprite sites. And Nano splicer correct the mapped uh, sprite junction for each junction within read, and this is important terminology. And uh, the, the two black dotted boxes uh, connected by a black line show a junction within read, uh, which is a sequence, which is a subsequence of mapped nanopore, mapped nanopore read. Uh, that is split and mapped to the different axons. Uh, so you can see there are, uh, in this figure, you can see the A junction within read. So with this input, a uh, nano splicer outputs for each junction within read, a list of uh, candidate sprite junctions and uh, assignment probabilities uh, quantifying the support for each of candidates. So in this toy example, uh, for this particular junction within read one, uh, nanospricer considers these two candidates. And given the assignment probabilities here, nanospricer correct the mapped sprite uh, junction using the candidate one because it has a high assignment probability. Then how does nanosplicer use the squiggle information to compute these assignment probabilities? Uh, the key idea is a squiggle matching. Uh, for each junction within read, uh, nanosplicer quantify the squiggle similarity between the observed junction squiggle and expected squiggle from each candidate and compute the assignment uh, probability based on that. Uh, uh, squiggle similarity. And this squiggle matching uh, idea has been successfully used uh, uh, to map raw signal to a reference genome in these papers. And here we adapt this idea to develop a method for sprite junction identification. So now I will give you an overview of the nano splicer method and discuss each step in detail later. And first, we identify all junction within read from the mapped uh, nanopore read. Then for each junction within read, if we first obtain a junction squiggle, that is the a squiggle section corresponding to the junction within read. Then we construct a list of uh, candidate junctions. And for each candidate, we obtain a candidate squiggle. And finally, we compute an assignment probability for each candidate uh, by quantifying the squiggle similarity between the observed junction squiggle and expected squiggle from the each candidate. Now, I will discuss each step in detail. The first step is to obtain a junction squiggle. Uh, to obtain the section of the squiggle corresponding to the junction within read location, uh, first, we align a nanopore read uh, containing the junction within read with each squiggle using with squiggle tool in Tombow. Uh, here, the alignment means the assigning, um, 
uh, assigning the current measurement in the squigger to each base of this nanopore weed. Then we extract the part of the squigger uh, aligned to bases in the junction within weed. The resulting junction squigger can be represented by a vector x here, xi is the i current measurement in this junction squigger. And the one issue is the for rare cases uh, where we identify an incorrect section of the squigger as a junction squigger. So we develop a, a procedure to find those junction squiggers that come from the off-target region. And I will talk about that later. The second step is the obtain candidate squiggers. Uh, to do that, first we choose candidates. Uh, and NanoSpricer provides multiple options for this candidate selection. Uh, by default, uh, we will select mapped sprite junction. That is a junction supported by the mapped read or the supported by the junction within read. So in this example, uh, candidate one is the mapped sprite junction, which is supported by this junction within read. And also by default, we select uh, nearby canonical sprite junctions uh, because over 90-90% of a sprite junction, uh, mammalian sprite junctions are canonical. And canonical sprite junctions are defined by uh, introns that start with a GT and end with uh, AG. So in this example, actually both candidates are canonical. The first candidate used this GT and AG pair, and the second candidate used this GT and the, the other AG. So by using the default option, uh, we don't need a annotation or match the short read or the information from other mapped read, but if that information's uh, information are available, is available, our software also allow users to incorporate them by providing flexible options for candidate selection. So with the selected candidates, uh, we first assemble junction motifs by connecting sequences from each side of candidate uh, junction using the reference genome. Then we obtain a candidate squiggle using the expected current level model in Tombow and this model provides the mean and standard deviation of the current level for each nucleotide, precisely speaking for each camer in a junction motif. Uh, here C1 represent the candidate squiggle one, that is the uh, sequence of uh, means and standard deviations for uh, the junction motif uh, for the candidate one, and the C2 represent the uh, candidate squiggle two. Uh, here, we visualize the uh, candidate squiggers by fitting lines through the sequence of means and plus minus standard deviations. So now we have uh, observed the junction squigger, uh, which uh, consists of a uh, observed current measurement and candidate squiggers, uh, which consists of mean and standard deviations of the current measurement. Uh, but before quantifying the uh, squiggle similarity, uh, we first align a junction squiggle to each of the candidate squiggles so that their time axes are comparable. So as I mentioned earlier, the speed at which uh, each molecule passes through the pole is not constant. So we adapt dynamic time warping DTW for the alignment of two squiggles. So DTW is an efficient algorithm for aligning two uh, sequences which may vary in speed. Uh, every possible uh, warping between two sequences is a path through this distance matrix. And we can find the best path or best alignment uh, which minimize the distance between two sequences using a recursive algorithm. So by adapting this DTW, particularly by placing some restrictions on a standard DTW, uh, we align a uh, junction squiggle to each of the uh, candidate squiggles. 
And these alignments uh, also provide the mean and standard deviation of each current measurement in the junction squiggle for each candidate. And for example, for candidate one, uh, the first the six a current measurement have the uh, this particular mean and standard deviation corresponding to the first nucleotide of its junction motif. And next, the four uh, current measurement have the uh, this particular mean and standard deviation corresponding to the second nucleotide. Okay, so now we are ready to quantify uh, squiggle similarity. And suppose we have a, a junction squiggle X and uh, capital M candidate squiggles and capital M alignments, and each of which aligns the junction squiggle X to each uh, candidate squiggle. Uh, here, CM represent the M uh, candidate squiggle, and here, AM uh, represent the alignment between the junction squiggle X and the candidate squiggle CM. Now we introduce a uh, latent variable Z uh, indicating which candidate the junction squiggle came from. And we can model uh, the junction squiggle X using the mixture model shown here. And we quantify the squiggle similarity between uh, the junction squiggle X and the candidate squiggle CM by treating the uh, junction squiggle X as observation from a model that has the means and standard deviations in CM as parameters. Uh, but there is one issue. The junction squiggle X is a very noisy measurement. So actually what we did is the, instead of modeling X directly, we partition the um, junction squiggle into uh, multiple segments and combine this noise measurement into more stable summary and use that summary as the data in the model, in our model. Uh, so in our analysis, we use the medians for the summary uh, as they are robust, relatively robust to our layers. And we define a segment of the junction squiggle X uh, by a consecutive measurement in X such that for each candidate, they are aligned to the same mean and standard deviation as each other. Uh, I will illustrate the segmentation procedure using a toy example with two uh, candidate squiggles. Uh, so in this right panel, uh, each measurement in X is uh, shown vertically aligned with its corresponding uh, mean and standard deviation in each candidate. Then we segment the junction squiggle so that for each candidate, the measurement in a segment are aligned to the same means and standard deviation as each other. Then we compute the summary values Y, uh, where YI summarize the information in junction squiggle at its ith segment. And this segmentation uh, ensures that summary values y are well defined uh, for all candidates so we can model uh, the summary value y using the mixture model we considered earlier like this here instead of x now we are using y okay the uh, here one issue is the the standard deviation of the summary values are expected to be smaller than that of original measurement so we estimate the standard deviation of uh, Y from the data and obtain the candidate squiggles for Y. So here the CM, although I use the same notation, here the uh, candidate squiggle CM is the, uh, CM is the candidate squiggle for the summary values, which contains the mean and standard deviations uh, for Y. And here alignment, although I use the same notation, here AM, uh, AN represent the alignment between the summary values Y and the new CN. Then for each component, we assume the summary values are independent, conditional on their means and standard deviations. Uh, for, 
for each summary value yn, we model it uh, using modified normal distributions, which have a flat tails, uh, so that our method can be robust to measurement that match none of the candidate squibbles. And such measurements could appear, uh, for example, uh, due to the genetic variants, which are not uh, currently incorporated into our junction motif construction. Uh, the mixing proportion uh, represent a prior probability of a particular candidate to be the uh, spike junction. Uh, if there is no prior information on that, then we use uh, equal probabilities for all candidates. Uh, when other information is available, then we model the mixing proportion as a function of that information. Uh, for example, in our uh, real data analysis, we model this mixing proportion as a function of nucleotide composition near spike size. So finally, a, we can identify a spike junction for each junction within read uh, using this posterior probability of G, which we call the assignment probability, and that quantifies the support of uh, support in the junction speaker for its candidate. Uh, in practice, we restrict our identification to junction within read where a single candidate has a strong support. And for example, in our analysis, we require the strongest assignment probability bigger than uh, 0.8. Uh, our model assumes the junction squiggle corresponds to the location of the junction within read. But, I uh, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, when we identify a junction squiggle using Tombow, um, sometimes it can potentially, it can align the junction within read to an incorrect squiggle location. So in practice, we add a step to find uh, those junction squiggles that come from an off-target region by identifying uh, junction squiggles that do not have uh, high quality alignments to any candidate squiggle. Uh, first, we measure the uh, alignment quality uh, SM between a uh, junction squiggle and the M candidate squiggle uh, by using a uh, average low likelihood over nucleotide uh, uh, in, their, in their junction motif. And we define a squiggle information quality SIQ uh, by the maximum values of those uh, alignment quality uh, across all candidates. Uh, then we restrict our sprite junction identification to the junction within read uh, with uh, a, a squiggle information quality bigger than a threshold uh, to ensure their junction squiggles have high quality alignment at least one of the, their candidate. So we choose a threshold uh, using an empirical distribution of SIQ uh, constructed by pulling SIQ values from multiple junction within read. In summary, uh, nanospicer takes as input a reference genome and a mapped nanopore read and their squiggles. And with this input, a nanospicer uses the squiggle matching idea and provide for each junction within read a list of uh, candidate spike junctions and assignment probabilities quantifying the support for each candidate and squiggle information quality. And we assess the performance of nanospicer using a uh, nanopore data set gener generated from uh, the lung cancer cell line. And we use this particular data set because uh, short width data are available for the same sample. So we can use them to define a, a ground truth. So we base code uh, squiggers using Guppy and we mapped base code read to a reference genome using Minimap2. And for the purpose of assessment, we define a ground truth spike junction for each junction within read using matched short read because a short read uh, 
uh, have a more accurate information on uh, a supply junction location. And we focus on around 2 million junction within read uh, from Nanopore read map to chromosome one, and that have at most one year by short read supported spy junction uh, to avoid ambiguity in determining the ground truth. Uh, the potential advantage of nano splicer is that uh, it can use the uh, squiggle information. So to assess uh, the benefit of this feature, we compare the performance of nano splicer to the initial mapping wizard. The initial mapping failed to identify the ground truth for 5.4% uh, of junction within read. And by using the squiggle information, uh, nano splicer reduced the error rate to 3.9%. And to better understand the uh, advantages of nano splicer, we next ask uh, under what circumstances nano splicer improve upon spite, uh, the initial mapping wizard. Uh, base coding errors can result in, in a low quality alignments between the junction within read and a reference genome. So we hypothesize that the initial mapping would perform poorly for junction within read with a high base coding errors, so that the advantage of nano splicer would be greatest for this junction within read. Uh, to test it, uh, we quantify the junction alignment quality for each junction within read using the percentage of matched bases in each alignment. Uh, for example, uh, junction alignment quality of 0.9 here uh, can be interpreted as 10% uh, of bases in uh, alignment being inserted, deleted, or mismatched. Uh, this figure shows uh, the accuracy of each approach for a junction within read with a different ranges of a junction alignment quality, a gray for initial mapping and orange for nano splicer. And the accuracy is defined as the uh, proportion of a correctly identified spike junction. And first, let's look at the junction within weed whose alignment quality is above 0.95. So the junction within weed sequence aligns almost perfectly. Uh, in such case, uh, there is little extra information to be obtained from the speaker. So, Nano splicer and initial mapping are both similarly accurate. But uh, at alignment quality below 0.95, uh, nano splicer improves upon the initial mapping, uh, showing a uh, larger improvement as alignment quality decreases. Uh, in particular, uh, for junction alignment quality below 0.8 here, a uh, nano splicer increased the row accuracy by 0.13 and decreased the proportion of uh, incorrect junction within read by 50%. So now I will show you an example of nano splicer correcting a uh, wrongly mapped junction within read uh, to demonstrate how nano splicer use uh, squiggle information to identify spike junctions. So in this figure, uh, purple line is a reference genome and the mapped nanopore weed in blue shows uh, the base code nucleotides and how they were mapped to the reference genome. Uh, the inserted nucleotide in gray is base code nucleotide in, the, in this nanopore weed that is not part of the genome alignments. Uh, orange line shows the uh, spike junction location identified by the initial mapping of this nanopore weed. And the green line shows the location of uh, true spike junctions uh, supported by short weed. Based on the ground truth, uh, the last three exonic bases before uh, five prime spike sites should be GTZ, but they were base code as uh, only G. And because of this base coding error in this nanopore weed, uh, initial 
uh, initial mapping aligned this nanopore width to the wrong uh, uh, spike junction location. So now let's look at how nanosplicer uses the squiggle information to identify the ground through spike junction. Uh, both uh, spike junctions are canonical. Uh, you can see the uh, start with GT and GT and end with uh, AG. And so nanosplicer considered both of them as a candidate. Uh, let me first uh, explain what information are shown in each panel. Uh, top panel shows the alignment between the junction squiggle in blue uh, and the expected squiggle of the spike junction from the initial mapping in orange. Uh, bottom panel shows the uh, alignment for the expected squiggle of the true spike junction in green. And in both panels, uh, each current measurement in the uh, junction squiggle is vertically aligned with its assigned, uh, its assigned mean and standard deviation uh, in the candidate squiggles. Uh, the junction motif for each candidate are shown at the top of uh, each panel. You can see the junction motif. Uh, and now you can see a true spike junction contains an additional three nucleotide GTG. And this is uh, in their junction motif, and this corresponds to the GTG over here. Uh, now let's look at the alignment patterns. The shape of the expected squiggle of the true spike junction, this one, is clearly a better match for uh, the junction squiggle. Uh, but the expected squiggle from the initial mapping here. Uh, they missed the clear signal chains uh, here and here, which indicate additional nucleotides. And nanosplicer quantified uh, this figure similarity using its model and provide the assignment probability 0.99 to uh, true spike junction and identify the ground truth for this example. Okay, so in summary, uh, we developed a narrow splicer that used the squiggle information to improve spike junction identification. Uh, our method do not require, uh, does not require annotations or match the short read, and its performance is not affected by other mapped read or the read depth. So it has a potential to uh, better identify rare spike junctions. And we demonstrate the improved performance of nanosplicer compared to the initial mapping, particularly for junction within read with low junction alignment quality. The preprint is available in BioArchive, and the software package implementing the proposed method is publicly available in this GitHub repository. Uh, as a discussion, uh, first, Nanosplicer identifies the spike junction only among candidates, so potentially leading to false detection uh, when the true junctions are not included as candidate. But we are not alone in having this kind of limitation. For example, other tools restrict their correction to junctions from annotations or match the short read or to junctions supported by other mapped uh, read. Uh, however, uh, we provide a flexible options for the candidate selection so the user can use the context dependent candidates. And also in our empirical analysis, we observe the squiggle information quality and the assignment probability help filter out junction within read without the true junction as a candidate, so we can reduce the false detection. And potential improvement. Um, our model uh, used the uh, summary values uh, as a data, and we ignore the uncertainty of those summary values. So incorporating uh, this uncertainty in the model will help improve a narrow surprise of performance. Uh, and the uh, uh, dwell time issue. Uh, very short or long dwell times may not deflect uh, typical translocation events in nanopore sequencing, so they may cause misreading result. 
So currently, we partly address this issue by filtering out a summary values based on those dwell time, but more principal approach such as modeling dwell time uh, could potentially improve the performance and the further analysis and testing. So uh, we tested a nanosplicer only for uh, analysis of uh, nanopore uh, cDNA RNA sequencing and the R9 pore, but we will test it on direct RNA sequencing and the R10 pore in the future. And the last point, actually, this is an important point. Uh, so nanosplicer provide a spike junction identification uh, the identified junction could be used in different types of downstream analysis, but for some analysis, uh, nanosplicer's output should be used with care uh, because nanosplicer identifies a spike junction only for junction within read, within read whose figures are informative. And for example, uh, if someone want to use the nanosplicer output for the spike junction quantification, then excluding junction within read without identified outputs or correcting them using the, uh, the spike junction from other mapped read may lead to less accurate quantification because those junction within read uh, without the identified outputs are not a random subset of all junction we didn't read. And we have the plot in our supplementary material. And we are currently investigating to what extent these uh, ad hoc approaches can provide a good performance in a sprite junction or isoform quantification. Uh, finally, uh, I want to acknowledge my co-authors and uh, met which group for sharing the uh, the nanopore data and the short read data, and so now I'm happy to take any questions and comments. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. The work is fantastic, and also your presentation was incredibly clear. So that was uh, very much appreciated. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'd encourage anyone who has any questions to uh, just uh, turn their microphone on and start speaking. And whilst people are preparing themselves, I will I would add I will ask a question. Um, so I, I had kind of the opposite question to your first point in your discussion because I, I guess you're saying there that because the candidates are kind of um, competing with one another, if there's a candidate that you know is excluded from the set. The, the you know would be the best one then you, you can't find it but I, I was wondering if you have a whole bunch of candidates so if you have lots and lots of candidates then could it happen that because your probability is kind of shared out amongst them that mm. that ends up with them being just below the threshold at which you would accept oh yeah but actually uh, when I look at the or a lot of examples if there is a uh, one candidate which really look like they observed the junction squigger, usually they have a really strong uh, assignment probability like a 0.99. And usually when we observe uh, assignment probability 0 0.5 and 0 0.5, it's not because uh, uh, it's not because like uh, the it's it's better to interpret the uh, junction squigger usually do not have information to distinguish these two uh, candidates. So if there is only one which has really, really good match, then actually usually assignment probability would be really, really strong. Fantastic. And another sort of technical question, I guess, and I'm not sure how important this is, that in your modified normal distribution, how do you decide how, how wide the tail should be? Yeah, oh, so, okay, let's go to that uh, here. So actually, there are two. Uh, we need to choose two things. One is the uh, this constant c, and other uh, this will because it should be a probability density. So we cannot make a uh, infinite, <laughs> uh, non-zero tails. So for the for the um, 
So we obtain the junction squiggle using the uh, tombow, and the tombow does some normalization. So uh, the, our junction squiggle is kind of normalized the uh, current measurement. And so usually they uh, stay in minus four to four. And so we choose the C as a four. And another one is the when we want to make, when when is the starting point to making the flat taste? So we did some uh, in our supplementary material, and we did kind of we tried a different quantiles and uh, what we observed is uh, this adding this modified uh, the flat taste uh, definitely help but it, it you'd better to use this uh, where you want to make a flat really really like at the close to the uh, the end of the quantile so we did some kind of a, kind of robustness uh, uh, analysis in our supplementary material Fantastic. And I guess something that just occurred to me is that this reminds me a little bit of some work, sorry, this bit here with the mixed modeling um, that Christian Robert and others did a few years ago in which they were, they were thinking about how to do model selection. And uh, one of the solutions they came up with was just to put all of your models into a mixture model. And then uh, you have your, your kind of probabilities associated with each uh, mixture model, and you just do inference on those probabilities, the mixture weights, and that gives you something which is a bit like a model selection score. Because this seems a little bit like doing model selection where your different models are different candidates, which is really neat. Um, yeah. Anyway, so I, that's just a comment. I don't know if it's particularly. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> does anyone else have any, any questions? I'm sure that there will be questions. I think uh, people are just being shy this early in the morning. But I understand actually this topic is very specific. So I was uh, actually when I prepared the slides, uh, I was quite worried. Uh, uh, can I deliver the, the contents uh, in an understandable way? <laughs> I, I thought it was incredibly clear. I, I, you've really uh, taught me a lot about this this technology and how this works. And, and oh, I, again, <laughs> I mean, so the, the one thing that occurred to me, because inevitably when you're listening to things that you don't know too much about, you try and link it to things that you do know something about. And I mean, I guess this is just a, a, a property of doing work where you're doing some kind of matching involving um, uh, yeah, doing matching because there were when you started talking about this, I, I I've done a little bit of work with um, mass spectra, and in those there's this um, uh, probably uh, peptide spectral matching that goes on where you have this yeah. scoring for a peptide against the the spectrum, and I, I guess there's some similarities, vaguely, uh -huh. but but really I mean they have it much easier than you have it because you have you have this sequence that you have to think about, whereas in a in a mass spectrum, you're just kind of trying to work out if in this big collection of, of stuff, there is some peptide that appears. But it, it really, yeah, I thought this was really interesting. Um, anyone else, if there are no other questions, but I hope there will be, come on, someone must have something. <laughs> ah, no. Well, in that case, um, let me thank you very much again for joining us. And uh, maybe maybe we should leave things there. But uh, Anna, Anna has oh, there's some there's some. <laughs> Anna has said, Thank you. That was very clear. So there's, there are some comments in the chat. But, um, yeah, thank no, you so was... much for the comments. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you so much for the, these nice comments. <laughs> um, great. Thank you. Everyone started thanking you now, which I think is uh, drawing this to a, a natural conclusion. Um, thank you very much again. Uh, everyone else who's on the line, I understand there is another BSU seminar later today. Um, oh. So um, if you if you wish to join for that, I think was registration required for that, Alison? I don't know if Alison is still with us. Yes, I am. Um, so registration to attend in person, um, which has now finished. But um, if you would like to participate virtually and you don't yet have the Zoom info, then please do just let me know and I will send you the details for this afternoon. Fantastic. And in that case, uh, let me thank you again, Hee Jung. And, uh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I look forward to, to going through your preprint properly and, and seeing it in press soon because it, it seems like a fantastic piece of work. Thank you. Uh, if you have any comments, just email me. And uh, thank you so much for all the comments. <laughs> no problem. Thanks very much. Okay. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.